Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. Once again, if you would care to become a patron of the podcast, please just take a look at patreon.com forward slash the History Network. You can sign up as a patron for as little as a dollar per episode and it really helps us produce these episodes for you. No obligation, of course, and you can unsubscribe any time. And whatever you do pledge, you only pay if and when we release new episodes. So it's not a monthly subscription that you just pay for whether we produce anything or not. Um, it's only if we produce content that your pledge is taken. We really do appreciate every one of you that has become a patron of the podcast. Thank you. The History Network.org podcast, season 33, episode 4, Epaminondas of Thebes, part 2. This episode was written by Murray Dom. Murray is an ancient and medieval military historian from New Zealand living in Australia. He has written more than 100 articles on various aspects of ancient and medieval military history as well as other historical topics from all periods, ranging from the history of opera to the runic alphabet and recipients of the Victoria Cross. He is the author of Macedonian Phalangite versus Persian Warrior, Athenian Hoplite versus Spartan Hoplite, and Leuctra 371 BC, all from Osprey Publishing. He is our regular writer on here and a regular contributor to the Ancient Warfare podcast. Epaminondas's victory at Leuctra created the Theban hegemony, a brief period where Thebes dominated Greek politics. There has always been criticism that when Thebes defeated Sparta at the Battle of Leuctra, they had no real plan to replace the Spartan domination of Greece with one of their own. Hence, the Theban hegemony of Greece was short-lived. One consideration to keep in mind is that Thebes only sought to end Spartan domination, not replace it. By achieving that feat at Leuctra, they actually created a power vacuum, which would eventually be filled by Macedon under Philip II, achieving domination of Greece in 338. That Thebes, and more importantly Epaminondas himself, did have a plan to utterly destroy Spartan domination of Greek politics, can be seen in his next actions. In 370 BC, Epaminondas led an invasion of the Peloponnese itself, taking advantage of grievances against the Spartans in the Peloponnese. The states of Elis and Arcadia in particular chafed at Spartan dominance and they formed a league opposing Sparta in 370. They were soon joined by Argos, envoys came to Thebes and both Epaminondas and Pelopidas, Boeotarchs for 370, persuaded the Theban government to support an alliance. The alliance members ringed Sparta and could force Sparta to defend their homeland rather than venture further afield in Greece and thus ensure the autonomous identity of other Greek city-states. Epaminondas was the figure to whom the alliance looked to as their leader, even though there was no official position for him to be considered as such. He and Pelopidas were keen to invade the Peloponnese itself, and so later in the year they sent 6,000 troops to oppose a punitive Spartan expedition sent against Arcadia. When his force arrived, the Spartans had already departed Arcadia and so the opportunity to invade the Spartan homeland of Laconia presented itself. Winter campaigns were a rarity in Greek warfare and an invasion into Sparta's homeland was even rarer. The other Theban commanders however realised that their commands were due to expire at the end of the year and were in favour of returning home. Only Pelopidas and Epaminondas wanted to remain. Epaminondas persuaded the others to follow him and invaded the Spartan homeland of Laconia. 
via a four-pronged attack advancing along all four access routes. They could not all be defended adequately as the armies descended towards Sparta. No invading army had ever witnessed such a sight. The Eurotas River, swollen by winter rains, proved an obstacle, but Epaminondas's army burnt and destroyed as they went along the eastern bank, inflicting pain and suffering that the Spartans were used to dealing out to others, but not experiencing themselves. The failure of Sparta to muster an army against Epaminondas speaks to the catastrophic manpower shortage she now experienced. The Spartans were forced to enrol their slave class, the helots, as hoplites. Six thousand helots joined up, and Sparta soon realised it had armed its own slaves, who could easily turn against them. Eventually, Epaminondas was able to cross the Eurotas, and he did so unopposed. He marched his army into the outskirts of Sparta itself, but the Spartan policy pursued by King Agesilaus II was not to meet him in open battle. Such a tactic was entirely unspartan and attests to the fear Epaminondas had instilled in the much vaunted Spartans. Instead, Agesilaus did not concentrate his forces but kept them in garrisons and defending passes which were difficult to attack. Such a tactic left Epaminondas unable to take advantage of his huge army, which with allies numbered 40,000 men. Unable to come to a decisive battle, Epaminondas decided to ravage all of Laconia and to free Messenia, the helot homeland held under Spartan domination since the 8th century BC. Most of the towns of Laconia were unwalled, defence had never been necessary, and Epaminondas burnt them as he went, taking ample plunder with him. Helots and other disaffected Peloponnesians flocked to him. In 369, Epaminondas founded a new city in Messenia on the slopes of Mount Itomi to take advantage of those who opposed Spartan domination, who had not only found a voice for the first time against Spartan oppression, but also support, and not just from Epaminondas, but from Elis, Arcadia and Argos too. The city of Messene would be a permanent thorn in Sparta's side, from then on deplete her manpower even further and close the ring of states opposed to Sparta within the Peloponnese. There can be little doubt that the policy, foundation and even the location of Messene were the brainchild of Epaminondas. He sent invitations far and wide for any exiles to come to the city as a new home. It would become the focal point of resistance to Sparta. Epaminondas made sure the town was built and when spring came in 369 and the men of Elis, Argos and Arcadia departed for home, he left a garrison before departing for Thebes himself. There he was prosecuted for breaching the legality of his year-long office, which was meant to expire when 370 came to a close, and continuing it into a new year, the jury dismissed the charge. Sparta was forced to look for help from its old enemy, Athens, which recognised the threat a resurgent Thebes posed and sent men under their general Iphicrates. When Iphicrates learnt of Epaminondas's approach, however, he withdrew. Epaminondas's campaign had been a huge success, achieving things never before done or attempted or even contemplated. The establishment of Messene all but doomed Sparta to a slow death. Still, Epaminondas had not met and destroyed the Spartans in open battle once and for all, as he had intended. Sparta looked to cement its alliance with Athens, and Athens, fearful of the growth of Theban power, gladly assented. The Peloponnesians appealed to Thebes to invade Spartan lands again, and Epaminondas obliged. Pelopidas did not go with him, turning instead towards the Thessalians in the north. The Spartans sent their army to Corinth, who remained a Spartan ally, and were joined there by the Athenians to oppose the Theban invasion. Epaminondas, once more at the head of his forces, 
was again unable to draw the Spartan alliance out to face him in open battle. They stayed behind hastily constructed defences which barred Epaminondas's path into the Peloponnese. He attacked the Spartan camp at the changing of the watch and forced the defenders to retreat to a hill. Rather than attack the outnumbered defenders, Epaminondas chose to conclude a truce with the Spartan commander, allowing him to withdraw and give Epaminondas free passage. This action actually allowed those enemies of Epaminondas's power at Thebes to later accuse him of treason for not inflicting casualties on the Spartans when he had the chance. This charge perhaps shows an overall Theban policy to harm Sparta rather than replace her as the pre-eminent state in Greece. Epaminondas now went on to detach other Spartan allies by force or, if he could not do that, ravage and plunder their lands and crops. He took Sicyon, which gave him access to a port in the Peloponnese, and Pellini. The Spartans and Athenians once again refused to come out and face Epaminondas in open battle. Epaminondas's second invasion seems much less impressive than the first, but it did further harm to Sparta and rendered it unable to impose its will on other Greek states. There may have been dissatisfaction at Thebes towards Epaminondas' policies, concentrating as they did on the Peloponnese, because he was not re-elected Boeotarch for 368. Alternatively, this may have been a result of the prosecution of Epaminondas for treason by his enemies. Without Theban or Epaminondas's leadership, the Arcadians and Elians squabbled, eventually declaring war on each other in 365. Epaminondas rejoined the Theban army as a regular hoplite for the year of 368, when the army was serving against Alexander of Fieri in Thessaly and were led astray by their Boeotarchs. The men of the phalanx called on Epaminondas to lead them to safety. He stepped out of the line and did so, saving them from defeat. This reveals the high regard in which he was held by the rank and file and also his own humility of returning to the ranks when not elected for office. Epaminondas may also have been a member of the sacred band and so was recognised as an elite hoplite in his own right. Pelopidas died in 364 and Epaminondas seems to have taken over as Lokagos of the sacred band. In 366, Epaminondas invaded the Peloponnese a third time. This time he invaded Achaea in the north and sought to deprive Sparta of yet another ally. He also sought to build a fleet to rival Athens in the Aegean. This was a miscalculation. In 362, peace was concluded between Elis and Arcadia, but this soon embroiled Thebes and Epaminondas as leaders of the Boeotian Peloponnesian alliance. The pro Theban members of the alliance requested that Epaminondas lead an expedition to the Peloponnese. This was approved, but the Theban government put a caveat on the expedition requiring it to be concluded within four months. Epaminondas marched and the forces opposing him met at Mantinea. The army against him included men from Elis, Arcadia, Athens and part of the forces from Sparta. Epaminondas planned a bold night march on an undefended Sparta. The Spartan king Agesilaus II, who had only advanced seven miles from Sparta with the rest of the Spartan force, had time to fall back and prepare defences. Epaminondas's men swept into the city, the first force to ever do so, but the city was desperately defended and fighting in the narrow streets favoured the defenders. Epaminondas was forced back. He decided to return north and sent his cavalry ahead to try and seize Mantinea. Both of these gambits were bold and sound, but neither came out in Epaminondas's favour. Epaminondas marched his infantry north towards Mantinea in battle formation. He encountered the enemy forces drawn up at the narrowest point of the plain and ordered his men to ground arms. This gave the impression that he was camping for the night and some of the enemy forces likewise made camp. Sending his cavalry forward to create a dust cloud, Epaminondas ordered his units 
Lokoe to mass on the left wing where he was positioned. This formation mirrored the one used at Leuctra. Epaminondas's force probably numbered 25,000 to 30,000 and the opposing forces some 20,000. His dense left flank probably included all of the Boeotian hoplites, some 6,000 to 7,000 men. The plan, as at Leuctra, was to break through on the enemy right and then roll up the line preventing any group escaping to Mantinea. As before, the rest of the line was drawn up obliquely. Epaminondas advanced and, when the enemy noticed his approach, it threw them into a panic. The Boeotian cavalry saw off their poor quality Spartan opposition and their retreat disrupted the Spartan phalanx. Epaminondas's massed phalanx smashed into the Spartan right wing and, just as at Leuctra, they broke and ran. As the pursuit of the Spartans began, Epaminondas himself fell. Where he fell, the Boeotian phalanx halted and although victory was already won, they seemed to sense that they could do nothing without him. Men around a dying Epaminondas lamented that he had left no children to carry on his legacy. Epaminondas reproved his companions and reminded them that he had, in fact, two daughters, the battles of Leuctra and Mantinea. With Epaminondas's death, the Theban hegemony of Greece also died. Theban power did persist, however, and with Athens she was a power in Greece for a few more years until it was destroyed by Philip and Alexander at the Battle of Chaeronea in 338. Epaminondas's career was a remarkable one of amazing success, innovation, as well as tactical and strategic foresight. His fellow Boeotians knew what a prize they had in Epaminondas, and with his death they knew what they had lost. Well, thanks, Murray, for writing that two-parter for us. We do invite any of our listeners, if you have an idea for a podcast, to drop us a line. Um, And if you feel so tempted to write a script for that subject as well, we'd love to hear your ideas. But even if you just have a subject that you've not heard us cover, that you would like us to cover, then just drop us a line, info at thehistorynetwork.org for that. And once more I would like to appeal to you to become a patron of the podcast you may have heard a baby crying in the background there just uh, momentarily here and there while recording this um, because I now have six mouths to feed so if you do uh, feel tempted just to pledge a dollar per episode we would absolutely love it if you do that and once again we are most grateful for each and every one of our patrons of the podcast thank you well thanks again for listening you've been listening to the history network.org podcast written by murray darm read by nick barker